Welcome back to P2. Today we're going to look at Unit 1.5, Mathematical Proof. Now, this is essentially about following logical steps from facts and things that you already know to be true to eventually getting your statement of proof. Now, what we're going to be focusing on in this video are things like identities and some geometric proofs and stuff like that. The next video is when we'll start looking at methods of proof. So let's look at the first example here. Prove that this is equivalent to this. So the first thing to look at is my three lines. Very much like an equal sign. Uh, this is an equivalent sign and what it means is that we have an identity and when we have an identity what that really means is that everything on the left is identical to everything on the right it's just written a different way so we don't quite deal with it the same as if it was an equals because it's both sides are identical to each other it's kind of the same as saying you know four is identical to 2 plus 2. I don't start swapping things around with an equal sign. I don't start taking things from one side or adding things to another side. It just means that they're identical. They're just written differently. So how do we go about proving this? Well, it's very simple, very straightforward. What I need to do is start with one of my sides. Now, looking at this, I'm going to need to start with the left-hand side because that is something that I can deal with, expanding these brackets. Whereas the right-hand side, I would be trying to factorise this right-hand side, which is more difficult. Expanding triple brackets is easier than factorising a cubic. So I'd start with the left-hand side. Okay, and what I like to do is rewrite down that left-hand side to start me off. That's what I'm doing. Next step in this case would be to expand two of my brackets. So I'm going to leave this first one. As the second one is a little bit easier to expand, we got x squared. We've got 4x plus 7x is 11x. And 7 times 4 is 28 nice and easy. Now my next step is to multiply everything through by 5x and then multiply everything through by minus 2. So multiplying through by 5x I get 5x cubed plus 55x squared plus 140x. Now I need to multiply through by minus 2. So minus 2 times x squared, minus 2x squared, minus 2 times 11x, minus 22x, and minus 2 times 28, minus 56. And then finally, or one of the final steps then, is to simplify. So we have 5x cubed, and then I've got 55x squared minus 2x squared so that's going to be 53x squared 140x take away 22x as 118x and then finally my minus 56 and as you can see this equals the right hand side and that then is all I've done then to prove this and I don't need to go any further. Okay, this because I've got my left hand side and then it equals my right hand side, it does suffice for that final statement. So in this question here, we have an equation x squared plus kx plus 4 equals 0. k is constant and this has no real roots. Prove that k satisfies the inequality minus between k is between minus four and plus four. 
So nice straightforward one. We have to start off with a fact that we know to be true. And we know that b squared minus 4ac is less than 0 when there are no real roots. We know that's a fact. Now let's substitute my values in. So we get k squared minus 4 lots of 1 and 4 is less than 0. So we've got k squared minus 16 is less than 0. Now let's consider the graph of how this would look if I was thinking of y equals k squared minus 16. And I could do this as it's k minus 4 and k plus 4. Equally, I could look at critical values, which would be in the k squared minus 16 equal to 0, like so. There's a few different ways in which I can approach this one, um, and they all will give me the same answer. So here's my graph, just a rough sketch between 4 and minus 4. The part of the graph that is below the x value, or the x axis I should say, is this part is greater than minus 4, less than 4. So k we can see is between 4 and minus 4. And there we are. That's what we needed to prove. And there's no, no further kind of work and really required here. I should say that this type of question is unlikely to be examined. It's far more likely you're only going to get one proof question. An identity one, like the first example, is something that comes up quite often. A form of that doesn't mean it's exactly like that, but an identity one. Um, certainly later on in the A-level course with trigonometry. But... Uh, Otherwise, in terms of proof, it's probably going to be more like in the second video. But I will do a few that might come up in this video are linked with these. And these types of proofs are generally proofs by deduction. So for this type of question, I need to look at gradients. And I know the fact that two gradients, so gradient 1 and gradient 2, when they're multiplied together, it gives me minus 1 if they are perpendicular. And two perpendicular lines is that 90 degrees. Now, it's not obvious initially which ones to do. You know, we've got essentially the line AB, the line BC, and the line AC. So we do have three lines to essentially compare. Now, what I would always do is start off with my AB and BC. And then if they're not perpendicular, then I'd look at the final line AC. So let's look at the gradient of AB. Now, the gradient, or any gradient, is my difference in y's divided by my difference in x's. So when I'm looking at AB, I'm going to start with B as my second coordinate here. I've got, as you can see up there, 3 for my y, and A is 2 for my y. And then B is 5 for my x, and A is 3 for my x. doesn't matter which way around the signs will take care of themselves um, if you did it a different way around. 
So I can see here I've got 1 over 2, so my gradient is a half. Now let's look at the gradient of BC. So again, I've got so I've got 5 minus 3. I'm doing the C first here. And 4 minus 5. So on the top, I've got a gradient of 2. And on the bottom, I've got a gradient of minus 1. So that's going to give me my minus 2. Now, it is quite obvious here, but you do need to kind of finish it off. So you want your gradient of A, B times your gradient of B, C there. So gradient of A, B is a half. B, C is minus 2. And when I multiply them, I get negative 1. So A, B is perpendicular. to BC, therefore the triangle is a right angle triangle. Therefore triangle ABC is a right angled triangle. And there's a nice statement just to tie it together at the end. So for a question like this one, there's a few ways in which I could approach it, but essentially, when I'm proving that something is greater than something, uh, this type of thing, I want to look at this side and I want to think of completing the square. So if I take the left-hand side here, and I've got x squared minus 10x plus 28. Then if I complete the square, we get x minus 5 squared minus 25 plus 28. So that's x minus 5 squared plus 3. So now I can say, well, this has a minimum value of 3. Therefore, x squared minus 10x plus 28 is always greater than or equal to 3. So often, when we get a kind of diagram of a shape, a parallelogram in this case, they're usually labelled around in a circle, whether that's anti-clockwise or clockwise. And this is usually the way that it's done. But if I'd done it the other way, it would still should still work out the same. So what I want to do is, in this kind of case, I want to look at essentially the gradients of all four lines and check that obviously I'm going to get parallel lines here and parallel lines here assuming that these letters are in the right place the parallel bits might be different but essentially what I'm doing is following them around the letters in a circle kind of thing so I want to find A, B, B, C, C, D and D back to A. And I want to find the gradients of each of these. So I'm looking at the gradient of each of these. So when I'm thinking of my AB, just giving a bit more room there. So AB will be 2 minus 0 over 4 minus 0, which is 2 over 4 or 1 half. BC here, we've got 8 minus 2 over 6 minus 4. So 6 on the top, 2 on the bottom, so it's a gradient of 3. 
Now look at my other two lines. So C, D, so I'm just doing D minus C. So six minus eight is negative two. Two minus six is negative four. So that is gonna give me a half. And D, A, so we'll do A minus D just to keep it consistent. So you get zero minus six and zero minus two. So you get minus six over minus two, which is three. So we can see that we've got two gradients of a half and two gradients of three. And this is what we're left with. So now we can say that gradient of a b equals gradient of c d, therefore parallel, and then gradient of b c equals gradient of d a, therefore parallel. And then we can finish with two pairs of parallel sides, therefore shape or quadrilateral A, B, C, D is a parallelogram. And there we have it. Now, if I wanted to prove it was, say, a rhombus, I'd go about this in the same way. But then as an additional fact with a rhombus, all sides are the same length. So I'd also then have to use Pythagoras to confirm that all sides are of equal length. So it'd just be an additional couple of steps there. Hope you found today's video useful. As always, let me know in the comments. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing to my channel. See you next time.